This is my first visit to Israel, and I must say, I'm really, really happy to be here. Uh, there are people here that I have known for years online and that I have met for the first time, for example. You know, this is really, really great for me. So, today, what I have been asked to do is to do just an informal presentation without any, you know, PowerPoint or anything like that, and then to have a very interactive time so that everybody can ask questions and we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. And so I am going to start by spending maybe 10 minutes describing why this particular topic, the development of medicine against aging, is so important, and then a little bit about how we are doing it, how we are developing this medicine, and why we think that we have a good chance to develop them in the relatively near future, in time to benefit almost everybody who is sitting here tonight. So, first of all, I'm going to talk about the reason why this is such an important thing. I am a, a well-educated guy. I have the choice to work on anything I want. And until I was about 40 years old, I was not a biologist at all. I worked in artificial intelligence research. The reason I did that was because I thought that it was a really bad thing. It was really bad that people had to spend their time doing boring things, like, you know, mining and, you know, serving hamburgers and so on. And I wanted to have machines that could do all of those things so that we could spend our time doing what we're doing right now. You know, enjoying each other's company, enriching each other's lives. That's really what we are built to do and what our destiny is. And I want us to be able to do that. But then, when I was about 28, 29, I said, I began, began to realize that there was an even more important problem. That the main reason why we cannot enrich each other's lives it's because we get sick when we get old, and then we die, and we die, and that seems like a rather bad thing. And I realized that hardly anybody agreed with me. I discovered that an incredible number of people were perfectly happy with the fact that we get sick when we get old. But I'm not. I'm not happy with the reverse. So I decided that I would become a biologist and that I would work on this. And I have been very privileged, very lucky, that I have been able to become an important figure in this field. I have been able to make a big difference. And I'm going to carry on making a big difference until we're done, until we have got this thing fixed. But I bet that there are at least some people in this room who do not really understand why this is such an important thing to do. And I want to explain a little bit about why that is true. The main thing that I want to explain is really why, what is the need? Why aging needs to be considered in the same way that we consider diseases. So I'm going to ask you all a few questions. And they're going to be very easy questions. Okay. Here's the first question. Please raise your hand if you want to get Alzheimer's disease. Come on, come on, come on. Everyone, everyone. Yeah. Please raise your hand if there is some, if you don't want to get Alzheimer's disease, but there is some age at which you think you will want to get Alzheimer's disease. You don't want it now, but make this up if you want to get Alzheimer's disease at age 90. Anyone want to get Alzheimer's disease at age 90? No? Well, that would be easy. Okay. How about cancer? Anyone want to get cancer at age 90? Yeah. Good. Okay. So obviously, I could ask this question for a bunch of other reasons. Now, the thing is, how do anybody does get cancer at age 30? Basically, how do almost nobody get Alzheimer's disease at age 30? These diseases are related to how long ago you were born. Now, here's the next question. 
kind of anyone who is in Asia. You know what Asia is? Kind of anyone who thinks that people who were born long ago have less human rights, fewer human rights, than people who were born long ago. Yeah, okay, old people are people too. That's really important. Okay. So, at the moment, we have a problem with medicine. Medicine doesn't really work very well. And in particular, it is people that hardly work at all for people who were born a long time ago. We have almost no ability to keep people who were who born a long time ago healthy for longer than they would naturally be healthy. Think of anyone who is in favor of medical research. Okay, so here we are. Okay. I just wanted to ask the question whether we would raise that hand, just in case maybe we would understand the way that I can. Um, okay, good. I want to talk about medical research. So that means that you're in favor of the creation of medicines that are better than the medicines that we have today. Very good. Now, I believe that at the moment, at least it is arguable, and I think it's true, but at least it is arguable that medical care should be given to young people more than to old people. So the reason I think that that is at least an arguable position is simply because medicine doesn't work very well for old people. And therefore, you can deliver greater benefits if you prioritize giving the medicine to the young people. But that doesn't apply to medical research. It only applies to medicine that already exists. So, if we have a, if we have a position today where medicine works better for young people than for old people, but if we also have a position that says that old people are just as important as young people, then logically you make sure that it's particularly important to do medical research to develop medicine for old people. Now, about a year ago, I took part in a debate in England, in Oxford, in fact, with a very distinguished scientist named Colin Blakesmore. Colin is a neuroscientist who works on the biology of the brain, who is based in Oxford, and for four years, he was the head of the Medical Research Council. That is the government body which decides most of the funding for medical research in the United Kingdom. So he was an incredibly powerful, incredibly influential guy. And the reason that he and I had this debate was because he agreed with all of the things that I have said so far. He's in favor of medical research. He thinks that old people are people too. He thinks that medicine to the elderly is important. But he's not in favor of successful medicine to the elderly. He thinks that it would be a catastrophe, it would be a really bad thing if we had medicine that allowed people to stay really healthy as long as they live. And the reason he thinks it would be bad is because if that happened, if people had that medicine, they would live a really long time. Of course, we don't really know whether they would live a really long time. You know, the world might be hit by an asteroid in 10 years from now, or people could just get really bad at crossing the street, and they could get hit by trucks a lot, things like that. So, we would say that probably people will live a long time. Now, that makes no sense, right? He is completely ignoring the thing that he works on. He is putting to one side the fact that aging is bad for you, that we get all these diseases when we are old, and that these diseases are untreatable. He is saying we should let that be. And this guy was in charge of medical research in a big country, the United Kingdom. The really bad news. Someone says cell phone. Yeah. Anyone else who has a cell phone, I warn you, I have a laser cell phone. Yeah. Um, 
But we can also see that it's really difficult because the human body is so much more complicated than any human, any human made with it. Okay, so it's more, it's more difficult. So, as I say, we have a lot of detail in how to do this. Some parts of what we need to do are already so well developed that they are in the clinical form. Please raise your hand if you have, if you know what stem cell therapy is. Good, yeah. A lot of the most important stem cell therapy research that's been done in the world was actually done in Israel. So, Israel is an important country in that area. And in fact, I think it's likely that quite a lot of the other work that needs to be done in the future will also be done here, because some of the most leading researchers in some relevant areas are based here. But most of these areas that need to be developed are much less far along in the research path than stem cell therapy is. They are certainly not in clinical trials, and some of them are not even being tested in the laboratory in mice yet. They are only being tested in cells growing in a test tube or in a bird. You know, there's a long way to go. So, the faster we work, the sooner we will succeed. The harder we try, the sooner we will succeed. So that's why Science Research Foundation exists. That's why I have dedicated my life to this crusade. As it's because not only do I think this is an important crusade, the world's most important crusade, I also think that it is a feasible goal. That we do actually have a good chance of developing new technologies in the next couple of decades. That's all I really want to say. It's regenerative medicine for aging, rejuvenating the body. Of course, I encourage all of you to find out more details. Today, down there, I'm not even giving a PowerPoint presentation, so I cannot really tell you any of the time. But, of course, I've given many, many talks that are on YouTube or online as well. You can easily find them. I was just a few years ago called Ending Aging, which is very detailed in describing all of this. And actually, it is being translated into Hebrew at the moment, for those of you who prefer to read in Hebrew. Um, furthermore, of course, my foundation has a website, Sunspot.org, S-E-N-S dot A-R-G, and of course there is lots of detail there as well. But for now, all I can really do is say thank you for being here, and now I will be happy to answer any questions that you have and to have any discussions that you may like. Thank you. I do so the same Okay, so the question was, yeah, 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 yeah. Obviously, I'm going to have to repeat the question. So, the question was, what sort of diet do I have and what sort of supplements do I take? Well, I am one of those really lucky people. I can eat and drink exactly what I like and nothing happens. So, okay. so I am not recommending that everybody should eat and drink what they like because most people, you know, they will get overweight and so on and that's that. Uh, and if I were getting overweight as a result of drinking beer or whatever, then I would drink less beer, for sure. So, no, I don't do anything. Um, but, you know, everybody is different. The only general advice that I can give is listen to your body. Do what works for you. 
the same people are very different from each other that, you know, you can't get However, I want to say one other very important thing there. There are many, many people out there, many books out there that recommend this guy or that guy or what they're doing or what they're doing. And they make it sound as though by doing this thing, you will live 20 years longer or you will live 120 or something like that. It's complete nonsense. In most, in all, for almost everybody, and if you're really unlucky and you're going to die at the age of 60 because you've got, you know, early onset diabetes or something, if you're a normal person who's going to get perfectly happily to 80 anyway, then nothing that we have today will be able to add a significant amount to how long you will stay healthy and therefore how long you will live. A lot of people get so excited about things that they can already do that they are distracted from realizing how important it is to develop medicine that we do not yet have, the whole thing that I work on. So I wanted to mention that. Oh, hello? The question was, and I've had this question once or twice before in the past, the question was, what about overpopulation? If we were to, um, you know, defeat aging completely, wouldn't we have too many people? Now, I've got two answers for that. Well, I've got several answers actually, but um, <laughs> uh, and, 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 and many of them are unthinkable. But uh, uh, no, no answers at all. Number one, it's probably not going to happen. The amount of time that it takes for population to improve if we eliminate aging is uh, is really long. Because people are only going to get older at one year per year, right? So we're not going to have any 500 year old people for another 900 years, whatever happens. Um, and, and if you take them to a time, you've got to think of all of the other things that are happening at the same time. For example, you know, what's wrong with having 7 billion people on the planet? There's an easy answer to that. The problem is that we're using lots of fossil fuels and we're changing the environment as a result. Now, the reason we're using a lot of fossil fuels is because we don't have an alternative. We're not very good at, you know, we haven't yet developed nuclear fusion. We haven't yet piled the Sahara Desert with solar panels, things like that. But there's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't do those things. And it would be very, very stupid to presume that we will not do those things in the future. Anyway, we're talking about 50 years in the future, or 100 years, let alone 1,000 years. So the carrying capacity of the planet may very well increase fast enough, so it's okay to carry on having children, even if we're not dying so much as we can't do that. That's the first answer. The second answer is probably a little bit more aggressive. The second answer is, hello, did you raise your hand when I said who wants to get that kind of disease? I didn't think so. Did you raise your hand when I said who wants to get that kind of disease at the age of 90? I wouldn't think so. Right. So, it's up to you to ask uh, whether you are prepared to take the risk of having fewer children than you might like to have in order not to get out of And that applies to everybody here. Maybe there will be a problem. Maybe you will have to make hard choices between a high death rate or a low death rate. I don't know. I can't guarantee to any of you that we won't have to make that choice. But the question is, what choice will we make? Now, I'm not even saying I know what choice we will make. I'm just saying it seems fairly possible that we might choose the low death rate. And therefore, our duty today, our moral obligation today, is to give humanity of the future that choice. To develop these therapies so that in the future, people can decide whether to use the therapy. If we say, oh, we're going to be coming to the let's not go there, let's not develop these therapies, then what we're doing is we are denying people that choice. We are saying, we think you're going to have a problem, we're going to solve it by not giving you the choice. We're going to make you die rather than make you choose between dying and having fewer kids. It's not, it's just not morally acceptable. It's a good
So the question is about the step towards the working man. So everyone knows, I'm quite sure, that we have a problem at the moment that people are living longer and being paid a pension, and that is costing the government a lot of money, and the money is being provided by people who are still working, and the ratio between the number of people who are working and the number of people who are getting a pension is falling, which means that the whole thing is getting uncontrollable. And the result is that we are having to raise the age at which people can retire and get a pension. Now, it's pretty clear, furthermore, that we are not raising that age nearly fast enough to solve the problem of the imbalance between people who are working and people who are not working. But, there are two things that are relevant to the prospect of the uh, post-aging world in this regard. The first one is, Again, other technology. So when we were talking about other population, I mentioned that we might have renewable energy or fusion or whatever, that would mean that we could afford to have more people. It's the same here. What happens in the case of work is automation. Over the past century or so, in the industrialized world, we have had an enormous shift, especially in the past, let's say, 50 years, from manufacturing and agriculture jobs into service jobs. Okay. And that's the way it works. Most people who want to have a full-time job still have a full-time job. But service jobs are also becoming more and more automated. The reason we just back in earlier was because manufacturing and agriculture become more automated. You just didn't need so many people to do the same work. It's going to happen. It's happening in the service world as well. So we're coming to the point where we're going to have to change the nature of the working world and allow people to be wealthy even if they're not actually spending much time in employment. In fact, the fear we're going to accelerate. The fear that I used to work in, artificial intelligence, is really moving these days. And really, artificial intelligence is all about automation. It's all about removing the necessity for people to do things that are for So I don't think you can really talk about the proportion of the of one's life that one spends in war in the same way, even 50 years from now, that we do today. That's one answer. The second answer is the social contract, the moral contract with regard to pension. We have to ask ourselves, why do we have pensions at all? Why do we pay people to do nothing from the age of 65 or 57 or whatever? There's a simple answer to that. The reason we pay people to do nothing from the age of 65 is because we're very sorry for them. And the reason we're very sorry for them is because they're about to die. Now that's not going to be true anymore. So the whole idea of having a pension makes no sense. Even if you didn't have this increase in automation, it would make more sense to have some kind of periodic plan where, you know, you have, let's say, 10 years, you say that, and then you come back and do a different career for the next 40 years, you say. Okay, so that question has um, the question is about availability of these therapies, access to these therapies. Some people are very worried that these therapies will be very expensive, and therefore that they will only be available to people who have a lot of money. And of course, the basis for this story is the fact that that's how medicine works today. Expensive medicine are really hard to get, and you have to be able to pay for it. Now, why is this different? I thought it is different. It's very different. I thought that these medicines are going to be available to everybody very, very soon, almost immediately after they become available to anybody. So what's the difference? The difference is economic arithmetic. At the moment, high cost expensive medicines to the elderly, as I explained earlier, they don't work. They delay the air health of old age a little bit, and that's all. And then people get sick anyway, right? And they have to have the therapies that they would have had, the cheap therapies that they would have had anyway. And they consume resources and they don't have to look after them, they have to go after the doctors and so on and so forth. So it's just, it's just money down the drain. That's right, there's no money in the field. It's money down the drain. Now, therapies that genuinely rejuvenate people are completely different. 
this practice will allow people to carry on living in a truly useful, economically productive state, however long they live. So there will not be this period of consumption of reverses at the end of life anymore. It's just a matter of giving you time to be hit by a truck rather than a truck. Now, this makes all the difference if you think about it. It's not just that people will be more productive, also the money will not be spent on their medical care when they're sick if they won't do so, and also their kids will be more productive if they won't do anything else in their time. All the way all this adds up to is that these therapies will pay for themselves. And if you think about that from the point of view of any government, then what it means is that it would be economically suicidal not to make these therapies available, irrespective of the individual's ability to pay, to anybody who is old enough to need them. It will certainly be economically suicidal. The only real precedent that we have today in society for this sort of economic arithmetic is not in medical, it's actually basic education. Education is given for free, even in a really, you know, a country that really doesn't like taxation, like the USA, for example. You know, it's free. And the reason it's free is because everybody knows that if you don't educate your kids, then 20 years down the road, you're going to be fine. You are absolutely not going to be a functional country anymore. So, okay, it's going to be exactly the same as that. Uh, yeah. So the question is, aren't, aren't a lot of people dying of mutual causes? You know, without any of these particular diseases like Alzheimer's or cancer and so on. And that's absolutely true. Yes, uh, a, a bunch of people do die of no particular reason. It turns out, at least in most countries, that just as you're no longer allowed to write natural causes or old age as the cause of death on a death certificate. I have to come up with something like, you know, uh, cancer or, or, or diabetes. And, and, uh, and unfortunately, that's very misleading because basically they just oversimplify what was really going on if somebody had multiple conditions and there was no real clear women. Um, but here's the point. All of these declines in health whether we give them particular names that like cancer or not, they're still bad for you, and they're still caused by the same thing, the same changes throughout life. Ultimately, there are differences in the molecular and cellular structure of a 40-year-old relative to a 25-year-old. And those differences are what means that the 40-year-old has less long to live. Right? Now, all those differences cause the various diseases and disabilities of all those. So if we go in and we repair those molecular and cellular damages, those things that happen before we have symptoms, then we will be preventing the disease of all those, but we will also, at the same time, as a bonus for a few months, we will be postponing the other non-disease types of all over the ill health. We get it all in one package. Yep. Okay, so good question. So the question is, um, why should we necessarily only treat people who are in middle age or older, like people in their 50s or 60s or 70s? Why not treat people who are in their 20s? It's a very simple answer. As I mentioned earlier, this is all about preventative maintenance. It's all about repairing damage, not about preventing the creation of damage. So that means that this, the question is equivalent to the question, why don't you take a car, a brand new car, in for annual maintenance the day after you bought it? The answer is, there's not enough damage to repair. The body is already set up to tolerate perfectly well a certain amount of molecular and cellular damage, roughly the amount that you accumulate during your likely reproductive years, during the time that you're likely to be alive in the wild before being eaten or starving to death or breathing to death or something. So, um, there's, there's, there's no point in, there's no, there's no extra benefit from repairing the damage when there's hardly any damage. 
he might have been able to until there's a reasonable amount of damage to repair. Now, there's actually a second supplementary answer which is really important for practical purposes, which is when these therapy tests come along, like any new technology, like any new medical technology, they're not going to be very good. They're going to be a bit experimental, they're going to be a bit risky. So, if you get lucky, it doesn't mean you're 25 at the time these first generation therapies come along. It doesn't mean you happen to be able to get them. You have to get enough money away, you have to get them away. Would you? No. What you would want to do is wait 20 years or 30 years, maybe. Um, if you can, what is going to happen as a result of waiting? And in that time, the therapies are going to improve. They're going to get more comprehensive, they're going to get closer, and all that. So, that's the problem. Oh, there's a question. Pop it up. Okay, great question. Um, so, actually, this is, not, this is not just about yourself. This is about clinical practice here. So, the question is, um, well, let me, if, if I could rephrase the question slightly. Um, and once the medical industry is opposed to these therapies because they will stop people from getting sick and the medical industry makes its money out of sick people, that's basically the question, right? Um, so at the moment, you're absolutely right. The medical industry makes its money out of sick people, and therefore you would think that big pharmaceutical companies, for example, and big medical companies and so on, would really you know, not want these therapies. But here's the thing. The only reason why Big Pharma, what why the medical industry makes its money out of sick people is because that's where the market is. That's where the public put their money. So the problem is not really with the medical industry. The problem is with the attitude to medicine that the public has. At the moment, the public don't really trust medicine. And that means they don't really like the idea of preventative medicine. They don't really want to subject themselves to medical therapy until they're already sick. Because their intuition is that the risk benefit ratio is adverse, you know, it's negative. They would prefer to not take the risk of some bad thing happening when they're already sick, whereas it's just some how they are because they're not sick yet. Yeah? Um, now, if you can change that, if you can get preventative medicine to be taken more seriously, then the medical industry will follow along, because they'll follow the money. Right? They'll follow your public, your public to pay for it. So how do you do that? Well, there are a couple of good examples out there. At the moment, there are a couple of really popular types of drugs which are for overrated conditions and they are preventative. One of them is statin which are drugs that lower the production of cholesterol and therefore they slow down the production of cardiovascular disease. Another one is something called ACE inhibitors. And what they do is they reduce high blood pressure, which is again, of course, is an age-related condition. Now, it's still a little bit mysterious how this all happens. How those two families of drugs succeeded in winning the public in acceptance and enthusiasm. But they did. And there are fine examples of what I just said. They got popular with the public, and lo and behold, they're fine popular with the medical industry as well. So you just need to copy those examples for other types of drugs with medicine, and they'll be done. Okay, and Marvel's got to have. And you're going to like the end, especially for those of you who like having a somewhat um, um, a lifestyle that departs from what your mother tells you to do. Um, and so the, 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 the bigger question we're going to look at the time for the last year of life in our family. So the, 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 the essential question to the question was well, you know, there are many things that people like to do that increase the risk of going sick. Um, especially, for example, smoking, because of the risk of lung cancer. That's a fine example. Now, 
you may all be wondering, well, what does this mean? If I have the opportunity to take these therapies and therefore avoid being sick, does that mean that I'm going to have to be even more careful about not doing anything that might be bad for my health, like smoking? And the answer is no, it doesn't mean very clear. It means there's that sort Because the things that we do that are bad for the promotion of age-related problems, like, you know, if you smoke, you may get one time at an earlier age than you were otherwise would. So I'm still the age-related, you don't get it immediately, right? And, um, you know, things like that. And um, they're the same sort of damage. The process of getting those diseases is the same as it would be for the non-negotiable parts of aging, the fact that we have to dream, the fact that we have to eat, and so on. It's just that it happens faster. It means that the type of damage can be repaired by the same therapy. So what this adds up to is that if you have an unhealthy lifestyle, if you do things that create damage in your body more rapidly than if you live more healthily, then it just means that you will need to have these therapies a little bit more often, or a little bit more thoroughly. So it will still be the same therapy. So we will be able to go to McDonald's as often as we like, things like that. It's actually going to be a good thing for an unhealthy lifestyle. However, I want to emphasize a couple of things. First of all, don't do it yet, because we don't have these therapies yet, and I don't know how soon we're going to have them. I told you earlier that I think we have a 50 50 chance of getting these therapies in 20 or 25 years. Well, I think we have at least a 10% chance of not having them for 100 years, just because there's so much speculation involved in any long term prediction of technological progress. Okay, so, 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 yeah. Look after yourself for the moment. Alright, here we go. Alright, that is it. So, so then. So the question is about memory. Um, well, the, well, the question is why is that maybe if we live a lot longer than we currently do, then the brain won't work properly because it will be overloaded with being too full of, of experience. Now, we can answer this question fairly well. Of course, we, really, we don't really know until we talk. I, 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 I don't want to pretend that we do. But what we can say at the moment is we know a bit about how the brain encodes memories and how it retains them and which ones it retains. And there's no more than that we don't know, but we can say that memory is distributed. It's like a hologram. Where you know a particular fact is not stored in one particular neuron or in one particular synaptic connection, it's stored in a whole network of connections, and the same network stores lots and lots and lots of different memories and sort of overlap of the Now, the second thing we know is that when we have first learned something, we remember it well, and when we recall a memory, that was something that happened a long time ago, that also reinforces the memory. So we, so if we had learned it relatively recently. Which means that the things that we forget are things that we learned a long time ago and that didn't really matter to us because they were not coming back. Now, by the time we are married, or even in the age of most of you in this room, we are forgetting things a lot. Hang up anyone who really thinks that they can remember the names of every single person who was in their class at school when they were 10 years old. There's one person actually over time, right? I'm not sure. Okay, a couple more. Right? But not many of you, right? Hands up anyone who can't remember the names of every person and it bothers them that they can't remember. Still not very many. Okay, that's oh, that is very nice. Okay. Um, okay, so that way, the way you forget things that you don't really care about, it doesn't bother you. Now, if we look at the prospect of a very, very long lifespan, let's say it's a sort of argument, 10 times longer than the current normal lifespan, then it's just going to be stretched out. Even if the brain can only um, contain the same amount of information, it's going to be the information that we wanted to return. The things we will have forgotten will be a higher proportion of the things that we ever knew, but so the whole world. Plus also, there is this wonderful thing called the internet. 
Yeah, I think, I think, I think probably the one that only about one quarter of many phone numbers that I called 20 years ago. And that's not because I have got old ones, it's because I can't be bothered. I don't need to remember phone numbers anymore. So we have to take that into account as well. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, what, how will I design a course on longevity? How will I design the educational process to get people to be productive researchers to contribute to this mission? Right? That's the question? Yeah. Okay. Um, this is a modest question. I get similar questions all the time from people at every stage of our education asking for advice on what they should do next. You know, from people at high school asking what undergraduate degree they should do, from people at undergraduate level asking what type of PhD they should do, and so on. And it's not easy to answer. At the undergraduate level, the answer that I usually get is be as general as you can within biology. Do not specialize in any particular part of biology, like you know, biochemistry or genetics or whatever. Because aging is a really complicated thing that affects the organism, it affects our biology at every level of organization, molecular, cellular, everything. So the best type of basic training at an undergraduate level is at the level of generalization, generality. You want to, you want to have a reasonable class of the whole of biology if you can. At the higher level, let's say at the PhD level, it's not only about it's about making sure that you learn how to do research and you don't give up. And that's really hard. When you're getting going, working on problems that nobody else has ever solved, and you're doing it for the first time, which is what a PhD is all about, then you're going to have periods of time when nothing works. Sometimes those are really long periods of time, you know, six months when nothing works. And you have to do it for coming up to and, 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 and you go and see those that do that and come out the other side and carry on being productive. The best way to do that is to go in at the beginning of the PhD with the right attitude to what to your project, with a real passion for making it work. If you're not really sure that it was what you wanted to do in the first place, then the chances are that you're going to start and you want to get to it. So that's what I would say. Go with the hat. So the question is, do I do we promote psychological study as well as biological ones? And the answer in a formal sense is no, we don't do psychological studies per se, but we, do, we are interested in um, understanding the psychology of attitudes to all of this. So, for example, we may be actually starting a project quite soon, working on the similarities between negative attitudes to the development of medicine against aging and what, what I think is power management theory. This is a theory of psychology that was developed maybe 20, 20 years ago now uh, to understand how, um, um, how populations, especially in the industrialized world, react to the um, to terrorist threats and other um, areas, uh, other aspects of um, you know, really scary scenarios. And uh, a lot of people who have been thinking about the attitudes to the um, defeat of aging, and in particular the negative attitudes, the really, really unbelievably irrational attitudes um, held by otherwise very intelligent people, you know, they have seen some similarities with how people react in, in scenarios like that. So yes, yeah, that's something that we're certainly interested in. It's not a major part of that, but it's exciting. <laughs> Um, so the question is almost, um, nothing about how society will be in a first person world. No, we don't do that, and there's a very good reason why we don't do that. And it comes back to a couple of the questions I answered first, actually, a couple of the first two questions I answered, which were about how, we can, how much we can know, how much we can predict about what the world's going to be like. To me, 
history for the next year and the world gets into action. Yes, that's what the Federal Revolution is about. On, of course, there is the sense of the future as it is deliberate, which is a bit different. This is the case where the, um, the racist, well, 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 it's, not, it's not a matter of um, racist mutations becoming unracist, but rather a case of selective pressure as, as, as a competition and mind varying suddenly being reduced because, let's say, some whole bunch of politics goes away and then suddenly minor variants which would not previously have survived enough to become a new species suddenly can't survive, so you got a big radiation. Yeah, so, so these are you know, completely consistent with the way the revolution normally works. But there are other examples, like for example the, uh, uh, the movement of, of genes from the mitochondrial DNA to the nucleus, in which we can easily explain why the whole thing stops. And um, why there are these certain genes that are present that haven't been moved. And it's, it's, you can explain this in a manner that in no way um, precludes the possibility that we, as molecular biologists, could make that change just by you know, making a bunch of different changes that would not individually be selected for us. So, there's a number of hands that's going up and doing more of the All right. I've, I've been told I can only have two more questions, but it's in a very long space here. All right. We've got your hand up one time. All right. So, the question is trying to talk more about the nature of the work we're doing. How are we actually going to develop these technologies? I mean, so I, 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 so this is what we've already heard about, like stem cell therapy, replacing cells. In some cases, we need to remove cells because we have too many of them. So cancer is a fine example of that, and we have particular places to come back in cancer that we think are going to be much more powerful than we're just now. We also need to get rid of cells that accumulate too much because they don't die when they're supposed to, and we are interested in using something called suicide during therapy for that. This is all sort of new genes in the cell cells when they become in the state. Then, uh, just mentioned mitochondrial mutations is something that we want to do something about. We think that we can prevent the effects of mitochondrial mutations by getting copies of the mitochondrial DNA into the nucleus, in other words, completing the job that evolution has not yet completed. A couple of the things that we want to do involve removing molecular guidance from the cell. Uh, or from the present between cells. And this involves putting new enzymes into the cell that can destroy things that the body cannot naturally destroy. We often can find these enzymes in bacteria, and we have just recently published some very good successes in that area. Um, sometimes this stuff can be eliminated just by immunization. That's something that other people have been working on, and we're doing that too. And then one other last thing that we're really focused on is alleviating high blood pressure and other conditions that are caused by the thickening, the loss of elasticity of the extracellular matrix. So we're developing drugs to fix that problem. Um, but uh, that's about as long an answer as I can get in this forum, I think. Okay, one more question. Well, I'm going to say, I have you. Okay, the question is, how about non-biological solutions to the problem of aging? And of course, there are people out there looking at things like uploading, uh, transferring our consciousness to a different hardware, a more robust hardware. Um, uh, there are people looking at molecular manufacturing, nanotechnology, the creation of tiny, tiny machines that are more robust and more powerful than um, biological machines and um, so there are also more macroscopic non-biological solutions to medical problems, things like glasses, for example, or indeed cochlear implants, you know, to cure deafness. All of these things actually have their place. Some of them obviously are closer, uh, and more useful. Some of them are improving rapidly. Cochlear implants are a good example. People think that within five or ten years, cochlear implants are going to be better hearing than normal hearing. Okay. Um, 
I think the military manufacturing is still a long way away. I think it's going to be quite a long time before we can develop machines that can significantly contribute to medical um, treatment. And that's why I'm working on the schedule about medical care. But, and very well aware that I may be wrong, so I'm very pleased that there are people out there working on, on molecular manufacturing for so nanomedical research. Similarly, I mean, you know, I personally rather enjoy being made out of meat, but um, I can say that if the option were either to die and be, you know, irreversibly um, you know, decayed or else to be in some way transferred, then yeah, I'd, I'd take it. I am concerned that the process of transfer may be difficult to actually implement, very difficult to implement in a manner that really constitutes preservation of the individual. But of course, there's a lot of philosophical uncertainty about that. All right, so I'm supposed to stop now. Thank you very much, everybody.